Welcome to the city. I'm Anthony Wilson, the public information officer for the city of San Angelo. And joining us today is a recurring guest, our city clerk, Brian Kendrick. Brian, thanks for being with us. Good to be here. Now, I asked you here today to talk about two things, the first of those being elections. We are going to have a city election on May 7th. Tell us what's going to be on the ballot. Okay, the issues on this ballot are going to be the chief of police and then the council members for single member districts one, three, and five. Now, city council terms have historically been two years, but the winners of those three seats on the city council on May 7th will actually serve three-year terms. Explain why that is. Okay, as you know, the charter election was held last November and Proposition 1 on there uh, that was passed by a fairly wide uh, margin was for the uh, transition toward four-year terms. So the, uh, this year, the notation was in order to facilitate the continuation of the staggered terms, this year, May 2016, would be a three-year term. That way, we'll be uh, electing officers in those positions every two years. And so next year, when we have the city council election, we'll be electing representatives from districts two, four, and six, and the mayor, and those will be for four-year terms. For four-year term, yes. And then every year, at, or every other year after that is when we'll have the city council election. That's right. So for the voters, an important date, when is the deadline to register to vote, and how do people go about doing that? Okay, great. Yeah, the, uh, April 7th is 30 days before the election. That is the deadline to register to vote. And it's important to note because you will not be able to vote uh, in the election if you're not registered. So uh, more information can be found really by going into the elections office at Tom Green County or you can go to their website or votetexas.org um, and there's tons of information. Those are great tools to get registered. And I should mention the, uh, the elections office here in Tom Green County, their website is votetomgreencounty.org. Do you know what sort of uh, verification or identification that you need to bring in order to register to vote? Um, really, I think it's all there on the application. Like I said, if they go to votetexas.org, you know, some of those rules change periodically, so I might not be the best source for that information, but votetexas.org or Vote Tom Green County, I'm sure, have frequently asked questions on there. And so uh, looking ahead then to early voting, when and where will the early voting in the May 7th election begin? Okay. Early voting is going to start on April 25th and it's going to run, the first period is from April 25th through May 3rd and the hours will be held uh, from 8 to 5 and that'll be at the Ed B. Keys building. And then on the 4th and 5th of May, those hours will be extended uh, from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. and again at the Ed B. Keys building and you'll be able to vote either paper or electronically. Uh, either way will be available. And is there something that voters need to bring with them if they're looking to vote early? Yes, I think uh, uh, proper identification is really the key to, to voting that day, so, or, or their registration card. So a registration card, but probably also a, uh, an identification to show that you are in fact the person on the right, card. Right. So now on election day, again, May 7th, where will people vote on election day? Well, as you know, the last couple of election cycles, we went to what's called voting centers. And what we, what we have is we have 21 locations, and they're listed on our website at COSATX backs, uh, COSATX US backslash uh, May 2016. And there is a, a list of all 21 of the voting centers. And the great thing about that is it's really convenient to the citizens of San Angelo. Um, if you're out doing running errands on election day or if you have business that takes you to a different part of town, you can just go to the voting center that's closest to you, pop in and, and go ahead and vote. So it's been a, a, a really neat change and uh, like I said, it's much more convenient for the, for the voters. And so just to be clear, you can vote at any one of those 21 uh, polling places, doesn't matter where you live in regards to where the polling place is. That's right, that's what makes it so convenient. Also, I would note that on election day, you will not be able to vote at the Ed B. Keys building. They will be open to provide information on, on where the locations are to vote, but it's not a voting center on election day. And you mentioned during early voting, you can vote either paper with a paper ballot or electronically. Will that be true on election day itself? No, on election day, it'll be electronic only. And talk about when the polls will be open on election day, May the 7th. Uh, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. And when you, as with these new voting centers that we have in place, have you seen that having an impact on the number of people who are, who are voting because it does make it that much more convenient? Right, well we don't have a lot of information to go on yet, but we have seen an uptick. Uh, generally, historically, we've had around 10% of the registered voters come out to actually vote in the elections. 
but in the last two, which were both voting center elections, we have seen an uptick. Last May was 12, a little over 12 percent, and then in November we had over 14 percent. So, uh, you know, it's unclear whether or not that's directly tied to the voting centers or maybe just the electorate's getting more engaged, but either way, we like to see it, and we think it's going to be a pretty good turnout this year. Now, this year, of course, you mentioned that the police chief's race is also on the ballot. Do you anticipate that that will draw more voters? Because everyone in the city can vote on that, uh, districts one, three, and five. Only if you live in those districts can you vote in those races. Right. It's a, it's a citywide thing, and yeah, I think I think it is important, and I think voters are engaged. I think we saw that in the last, in the charter election. That they were engaged related to the to the vote there on the chief of police. So, um, yeah, I think it's going to drive the voter turnout, and we're expecting a pretty good turnout. Now, I know that you feel like I do that local elections are actually a lot more impactful on the lives of our citizenry than our state or even presidential elections. Explain why you think that is. I think the key to that is that these the issues that are decided locally are the ones that impact us most day to day. They're the things we see and touch on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, whether it be, you know, our water is a, is a huge concern. Uh, you know, that, that's going to be decided, and we're looking at that right now on what the next source of water is going to be. So those, those issues like water or streets or emergency services, those kind of things are, are all decided at the local level primar primarily. So uh, I think that's what kind of makes the local election so important. Now you also administer the applications for service on the city's 19 volunteer boards and commissions. This is the second thing I wanted to talk with you about today. Talk a little bit about why service on those 19 boards and commissions for the city is important. I think first and foremost, they're, they're the eyes and the ears of the, uh, of the city council members. So they'll vet out a process long before, and in most cases, long before it comes to the city council. So uh, they, they provide some of that vetting process so that when, you know, when it comes to city council, it comes with a recommendation from those boards uh, that, that kind of give the city council some more information on, on which to make the final vote. So. And what's typically involved with board service? I think the, the key to board service is enthusiasm and, uh, and being there, attendance. So, so being involved and being, uh, being attentive to it. So what I always do is I encourage people to apply for service on a board that is close to their heart, this issue close to their heart, whether it be parks and recreation for some or you know, uh, uh, animal services, those, those sort of things. Um, they're important to different people, so I, I, I encourage people to to apply for service on a board that's that's close to their heart, and then be engaged and uh, be attentive to it. And, and you mentioned attendance. Most of our boards meet once a month for somewhere in the neighborhood of about an hour, so it's not a a terribly burdensome right. commitment. That's that's exactly right, and and it's so important to for the city council members to have you know that extra input. You, you mentioned uh, about the the finding something that, uh, that you're passionate about. And I like to say our boards run the gamut from A, animal services or the airport, all the way to Z, the, the zoning board uh, right. of adjustment. Uh, so you can definitely find an interest uh, uh, among those boards. Who makes the decision on who serves on those boards and commissions? Well, most boards have, uh, each city council member has a representative on the board. There are some that are, that are different than that, but typically each council member will have a representative on each board. And the process really comes in from them applying through, through my office and we forward those applications on to the city council members and then the council members will make a nomination based on that. It'll be on the agenda and the entire council will, will vote to affirm that nomination. Do council members generally like to appoint someone who lives within their district or, or do they uh, take different viewpoints on that? It really depends on the board. Some boards require them to be inside of the certain districts or you know, it requires them to meet certain uh, uh, occupational guidelines or, or whatever. So it, it just really depends on the board on those issues. So how and where can people apply to serve on one of our boards and commissions? Well, if you're somebody who likes the paper in your hand, you can, you can either go to the website and download and print it, um, or, and, or you can come into our office either way and uh, just turn it into to my office and we'll, we'll forward it to the appropriate city council member. The other way is to go, of course, to the website and you can actually apply online 
Uh, it's a simple process. It's, it's immediate. As soon as you click submit, I've got it, and I'm forwarding it to the city council member. So either way, it just depends on which way you prefer. And we should mention that URL is cosatx.us slash boards. Yes. Uh, where can people go for more information about the types of boards that we have uh, uh, and, and the responsibilities that they that they shoulder that same that same website there's tons of information uh, I believe there's a link on there for each and every board that'll give you the information of who's currently serving and the information related to that board and you can look up agendas and minutes from that board in most cases we've been talking with Brian Kendrick he is the city clerk for the city of San Angelo and when we come back we'll be talking with Brandy Gibson she is the new coordinator at the Nature Center but first we have a news report for you the work of combing through 20 tons of waste per day to sort recyclable paper, plastic, and cans falls to Butts Recycling, a local company that has staked its future on curbside recycling. Butts was founded 30 years ago as a small paper-only recycling facility. The family-owned operation had considered offering curbside recycling many times, but always concluded it needed partners. Republic Services approached Butts in 2014 as it prepared its proposal to the city for garbage collection and curbside recycling. Butts is not a party to the contract between the city and Republic Services. Republic offered to provide the recycling bins and collect recyclables curbside. Butts agreed to process the items and ship them to mills to be converted into reusable commodities. Republic came to us and asked if we would partner up with them on this feat, and we said yes, we would love to do it. Even so, Preston said she and her husband Fred had to carefully consider whether the venture was feasible. The couple knew that unlike Central Texas, San Angelo could not rely upon neighboring communities to increase the monthly tonnage. The Prestons also realized San Angelo citizens would undergo a steep learning curve as they grew accustomed to what they could and couldn't recycle. And Butts had to invest $500,000 into its operation, mostly for a new processing building and sorting equipment. If we lose, we lose. Or we'll be out of business, which is something that nobody wants. About 4.30 each weekday afternoon, Republic trucks arrive at Butts. Their loads are weighed and then unloaded into a 20-ton pile in the Butts yard. The next morning, workers spread out the waste and sort it by hand. Cardboard is picked out so it can be bundled. Portions that have been contaminated by food waste and other garbage are scooped up and discarded. The loose recyclables are moved into the sorting building. A front-end loader drops the recyclables onto a conveyor belt that feeds a sorting table on a platform about 20 feet above the ground. Workers hustle non-stop, picking out stray pieces of trash before the commodities are shuttled to their proper bins. One each for plastic bottles, assorted plastics, mixed paper, aluminum cans, and tin cans. Each commodity is bailed and trucked to mills in Arizona, Louisiana, Mexico, and other far-flung places where they are converted into usable materials. Currently, the amount of commodities San Angelo is generating, along with the prices they are yielding, are not covering butts operating expenses. The commodity market, it follows your economy. So it's very low right now. The, the plastic products are petroleum based and we all know where that is right now. The curbside recycling program does not accept glass. Because of San Angelo's remoteness, the shipping costs exceed glass's market value. The same is true of plastic shopping bags, which also clog but sorting equipment. Because but sorts recyclables by hand, glass also poses a safety hazard to its workers. A little bit, our gentlemen are up there hands-on. They're all with the hands, and a piece of glass comes by, the danger to them. Initially, the contamination rate among San Angeles recyclables was only about 10 percent. The Prestons had hoped it would remain below 18 percent. During the holiday months, however, the rate was 43 percent, though it has recently dipped into the 30s. But its workers have encountered dead animals, dirty diapers, hypodermic needles, rotted food, and human waste. Much of the contamination occurs when customers use their green recycling bin as a second garbage can. Some of it, Preston said, is obviously sparked by spite. A lot of it has to do with your public outlook on recycling. If you have a family here that says, we're going to recycle, the kids are all excited about it because they learn from school and everything, nine times out of ten, they're going to recycle. But if you have somebody here that, say, they go out to the garbage, the trash can, and they have a bag of trash and their trash is full, a lot of the times we see they're throwing it in the recycle. That eliminates their trash problem, but it does contaminate the recycling. The contamination rate poses a triple whammy for butts. First, it must hire more workers to sort the garbage from the usable recyclables. That drives up cost. Second, 
Recyclables are rendered unusable when they come into contact with contaminants. That reduces revenue. Lastly, Butts must pay Republic for carrying trash from its facility to the landfill. Despite the challenges, Sandra Preston remains optimistic about curbside recycling in San Angelo. The tonnage is increasing, awareness is growing, and the local culture is changing. Preston steadfastly maintains recycling will be good for San Angelo. It's not so much as recycling a product, it's keeping it out of the landfill. And if you keep that in mind, that we're helping our city and helping the earth, maybe you'll be more inclined to recycle. For SATV, I'm Anthony Wilson. Welcome back. We are joined now by Brandy Gibson. She is the brand spanking new coordinator out at the Nature Center. Brandy, thanks for being with us. Thank you. Now, you joined the Nature Center back in January. Tell us a little bit about your background. I did. Um, I grew up in rural northeast Arkansas, so I spent my childhood playing outside, uh, finding all kinds of animals, always trying to learn more. Um, so when I went to college, I knew I wanted to do something with wildlife. And so I, I did the wildlife ecology and management degree at Arkansas State University. Um, while I was there, I, I took part in several research opportunities. I've worked with um, eastern bluebirds, black bear, white-tailed deer, uh, several warbler species, and then lots of snakes as well at my former job at the Nature Center in Arkansas. So we had lots of snakes native to Arkansas. Um, also worked with alligators and some raptor species as well. So what about the Nature Center job intrigued you? Well, the job description itself, it was uh, similar to what I was doing at my former job. And I really enjoyed that there, um, but I was ready to move on and, and get some new experiences. And the Nature Center here um, had different varieties of animals to work with because I hadn't done a lot with uh, like the bobcats and the foxes that we have. So I was excited about a little bit of a different experience. Now for those who have never been, and I, and I highly commend uh, the Nature Center, talk a little bit about what the Nature Center is and the, and the offerings and programs that you have. Okay, well we have, uh, we're essentially a natural history museum and kind of a mini zoo. Um, so we have everything from fossils to rocks and minerals to, of course, live animals. Um, we have lots of programming going on out there. I mean, on any given day that you come out, um, we can get out animals for you to see up close and personal. You can touch some of them. Um, we, of course, never get any of the venomous or dangerous stuff out. So it's a really fun experience, a great learning experience that people in San Angelo should definitely take advantage of. So what have you learned about the Nature Center in your short time there that may have surprised you a little bit? Well, what's most surprising to me is the amount of volunteers that we get. Um, something I wasn't used to in Arkansas, but there are so many people willing to give up their time here to, to come out and help us make the Nature Center a better place. And our volunteers are really wonderful. So I, I'm really surprised by that. Well, talk about that. What are the sort of volunteer opportunities that you have there at the Nature Center? Uh, well, you have to be at least 13 years old. Um, you can do an ongoing volunteer experience. You know, if you just want to come back anytime that you want. Um, but we also offer, like, if you just want to come for one day and do a volunteer day, uh, we actually had 18 students from Angelo State University the other day that came out and, and volunteered, and some of them were terrified of the snakes, and they left it just really liking them. So they got some of them out and realized, hey, they're not so bad. So, you, uh, Speaking of snakes, you have one here with you today. Yeah. Uh, why don't you pull him out and talk a little bit about who you have here and... Uh, and, and what kind of snake this is. Okay. So this is Lefty. And Lefty That's an odd name for a snake since he yeah, does not have any hands, obviously. It is. Um, so Lefty's a milk snake. And they get their name from a long ago, um, people believing that they sucked milk from cows, which is anatomically impossible. Um, but they, they're often confused with the coral snake, which we have here in Texas as well. And that's because of their color pattern, so the red, black, and yellow. And now the milk snake is completely harmless, non-venomous, um, but the coral snake is highly venomous. And it's actually a member of the cobra family. So they have very, very potent venom. Um, the difference between the two is, is the color scheme or the way the colors touch each other. So in the milk snake, 
you see the red touches black, and in the coral snake, the red touches the yellow. So there's actually a saying, um, red on black, venom black, red on yellow, kill a fellow, or vice versa, however you want to say it. So if you ever encounter red, black, and yellow snake in the wild, you can just kind of, you know, say that little saying to yourself to see whether or not uh, it's venomous. Of course, if you're not sure, definitely don't pick it up. So uh, I assume then you enjoy snakes. I do. I've always been fascinated with them. Even as a little kid, I was always wanting to watch documentaries on them and learn more about them. They're just really fascinating to me. Now, why do you think it is that so many people are so afraid of snakes? You know, I think it's just a, a mental concept that maybe they've grown up and their parents have always said, don't mess with the snakes. All the snakes are bad. And they just kind of learned it. And then until they see for themselves that they're not all bad, some of them are actually quite beneficial to us, um, it's just something they can't grasp. Now, does the milk uh, snake, does it have any sort of uh, benefits uh, to the ecology? or? It does. Um, they eat, they have a hefty appetite for rodents. Um, so they keep your, your house and your barn free of rodents. And they spend a lot of time around barns. Um, just because of the, the rodent populations being higher around there. Um, they also are a member of the king snake family, and king snakes are known for eating venomous snakes, so occasionally they'll do that as well. So they'll help keep the bad snakes off your property. So how many different kinds of snakes do you have there at the, uh, the animals, uh, or excuse me, at the Nature Center? At the Nature Center, we probably have, let's see, we've got over 100 animals total. We probably have about 60 different snakes, if I had to guess. Very good. So I'll let you put Lefty down, and, okay. uh, and while you're doing that, I'll, I'll ask the next question. Of all the, those hundreds of animals that you've encountered there at the Nature Center, which one has interested you the most so far? Uh, well, the raccoon that we have is probably my favorite and her name is Meevil, and I'm not sure who named her, but it's, it rhymes with evil because she has a history of having a bad attitude. But I really think that she just has a preference over certain people because she has just been the sweetest thing to me. And I just, I love her. Um, she loves to eat grapes, so I hand feed her grapes in the afternoon. She usually sleeps all day in her hammock. So if you come out there, she's probably in her hammock with her blanket over her head. But in the afternoon, she gets a little more active and she's ready for her grapes. So. Now, I have seen her before, <laughs> and there are certain staff members where she will just crawl and cuddle all over them. Yeah. So is, are there animals that you're still, since you grew up in a different part of the country, are there animals that you're still learning a lot about? Definitely, definitely. The, the Gila monsters that we have there are quite interesting. And, and I knew that they were the only venomous lizard native to North America, but um, never really worked with them, actually never seen one in real life. Um, so they're something that I'm studying a little more upon. And then of course, we have an international room that has some animals that are um, not native to the North America. So there are several in there, um, the bearded dragons and the Chinese water dragons and things like that that I never really paid much attention to that I'm starting to learn more about, and they're, they're pretty neat. Now, even for those who have visited the Nature Center may not realize that you do offer memberships. Talk a little bit about what's involved with becoming a, a member and what the benefits are. Okay, well, um, we have memberships uh, all the way from individual up to corporate. So the individual memberships start at uh, $15 a year, so they're all paid annually. And the individual membership is just for one person. Uh, the family memberships are $25 a year, and that's for immediate family plus two guests. Um, allows you free admission to the Nature Center um, and also discounts on special events and birthday parties, things like that. Um, the benefactor membership is 75, <clears throat> and that allows you um, eligibility to use our facility for meetings or special events. Um, also allows you one private tour uh, per year and a meet the keeper experience for up to 15 people. And then our corporate membership is, I believe, 150 a year. And again, it allows you eligibility for meetings at our facility, and you can use indoor or outdoor spaces. Um, it provides, I think, two private tours per year and then uh, 
to meet a keeper experiences. So it's they're all really worth the worth the cost. And so you also have opportunities to sponsor animals. Talk about that. We do. Um, <clears throat> we have what is called our symbolic animal adoptions, and uh, starting at ten dollars is the basic adoption, and um, you'll get your animals information, and then. Um, $25 is our, our memorable adoption, I think, and uh, that one you'll get the animal's information and a frame photo, and then the $50 adoption, uh, you'll get a frame photo, the information, and a t-shirt. And so what these adoptions do, um, you're essentially funding that animal's habitat, um, food, and vet visits, and just their overall care. Um, there's also the option if you want to adopt an animal for someone as a gift, like some grandparents will do it for their grandkids that love the Nature Center, and, and that's a good option as well, and you can do that. So, You mentioned birthday parties earlier, and that's obviously one of your more popular offerings. <clears throat> What's involved with having a birthday party out at the Nature Center? A uh, birthday party allows you uh, two hours uh, for a private event at our center, and what that entails is usually a presentation. Um, so some of the animals, uh, she'll get them out and you'll get to hold them and pet them and she'll teach you all about them. Uh, Cat Bunker usually does our parties and she's exceptional. All the kids love her. Um, <clears throat> after your presentation, uh, you're allowed to do cake. You can explore the facility on your own. Uh, you can bring food. Now there are some things we don't allow and uh, if you do schedule a birthday party, we'll give you a contract uh, telling the, you know, the things you can bring, the things you can't bring. So. Uh, what sort of programming do you have on tap for this spring and this summer? Well, um, of course, tomorrow night is our Valentine's sleepover, so that's our, our most recent coming up event, and we still have some spots left for it, so it's not too late to sign up. Um, following that, on spring break, March 15th and 16th, we have some spring break day camps coming up, and those are for kindergarten through sixth grade, um, so you can call the Nature Center to sign up uh, or come by and those are going to be full of learning about our animals. Um, we're going to do some arts and crafts, and then, of course, we'll provide some snacks and things for the kids as well. Um, after that, see, I think March 26th is our Easter event. So that, of course, will include an Easter egg hunt. Um, we're going to have a parade of animals and then an Easter craft activity as well. What's your vision for the Nature Center? Well, what I've found is many people are just not aware of what we have to offer out there. Um, so what I would like to do is make the Nature Center more well known and get people, I mean, I've, I've talked to people who have lived in San Angelo for sev several years and they haven't been out there yet. So I just really want to get the community to know what we have out there, what we have to offer and get them to come out and take advantage of their nature center. So this is important information. Tell us where the nature center is, what the hours uh, of operation are, and what the admission is. Um, we are located at 7409 Knickerbocker Road. So we are right on Lake Nasworthy, directly across from the Stripes uh, Station. Our hours are Tuesday through Saturday, 12 to 5. And general admission is $3 for adults. $2 for kids 4 to 12 and then under 4 is free. And if people want more information about the Nature Center, where can they go to get that? Um, definitely go to our website. Um, it's cosatex, C-O-S-A-T-X dot U-S slash Nature Center. And Nature Center is all one word. So. And there you can also find photos of all of your animals. You certainly can. We've been talking with Brandi Gibson. She is the new coordinator for the Nature Center. And we hope you'll join us for the next episode of The City. Thank you